O oh God, you pour out the spirit of grace and love. Deliver us from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning hearts, we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to worship in First Oma uh, this morning, whether you're gathered here in our church in the Rowan Hall or watching online or listening to your sermon line. Those of us who are in church and those watching online and even those listening on the radio, we're going to turn to one another and uh, we can't greet one another with a brotherly or a sisterly kiss these days, but we can greet one another with a wave. So why not turn around and give each other a little wave? Not forgetting those up in the gallery. Perfect. I'm also delighted to welcome Gary and Bronwyn McCausland to the service today and to their families as we baptize baby Asher into Christ's worldwide church and into the family of First Oma Church. Due to the current circumstances, the baptism is going to be a little bit uh, different than usual with a few socially distancing measures put in place. But we can be assured that the Lord is present with us and he will bless us and be faithful to his promises. Things are getting a little bit more worrying at the moment, aren't they, with regard to the spread of coronavirus. So can I ask everyone to make sure that uh, your mask covers both your nose and your mouth. The exception is for those taking part at the front of church as we are a distance away from you. Remember to sanitize your hands as you leave church and please do not congregate in groups in the car park, but make your way home promptly. These might feel like restrictions to our liberty, but they are there to protect us and especially to protect the most vulnerable amongst us. So please do follow these guidelines, not just here on Sunday, but throughout the week. We hope uh, to be able to continue to meet together Sunday by Sunday in the coming months. And so the Kirk Session have made plans for harvest and communion services in October and November. Members will receive a letter in the coming days explaining how these services uh, will work. But essentially we're trying to ensure that everyone who wants to attend a harvest or a communion service in church can do so safely. So we're going to have two harvest morning uh, services, one on the 11th of October, which would be our traditional harvest Sunday, and the other on the 18th of October. And we're going to split uh, the congregation um, in two, depending on your surname. So if your surname begins with A to H, then please uh, make uh, the 11th of October the Sunday that you come to celebrate and to give thanks for harvest. If your surname is I to Z, then come on the 18th of October to celebrate harvest and to give thanks to God for his goodness to us. Both services will be live streamed, so if it's not your turn to come out that Sunday, then you can watch online. There might be limited space available for those who aren't able to watch the live stream and would prefer to come to church, but you may be seated in the Rowan Hall rather than here in church so that everyone gets the opportunity uh, to be in church for the harvest service. 
And the same arrangements will apply for communion. We will have our first communion service on the 25th of October and the second one on the 1st of November. Again, split alphabetically in that same way. Don't worry, you don't have to remember all of that because you are going to get a letter in the coming weeks from uh, your elder that will explain it um, to you. Along with that letter, you're going to get a little booklet on hope. Hope in uncertain times. And this has been published uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, seeking to give people um, hope in the midst of this uncertain day. And it's particularly for those who don't have a Christian faith or who are wondering about their Christian faith. But we're going to give a booklet to every member of uh, or every household in the congregation. And in that book, there are some contributions from Mary Berry, uh, the great baker, and Bear Grillis, the great adventurer, on their Christian faith and how it has helped them in uncertain times. Read the booklet for yourselves, and then maybe think um, about passing it on to others. Um, obviously, if you do so, make sure that it's sanitised, or you can always order more booklets uh, yourself. So it is uh, an uncertain time for us, but the one thing that we can be certain of is that we can come before our great God in prayer and he will hear our prayers. So let us join together in prayer. All glorious God, we give you thanks in your son, Jesus Christ. You have given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You chose us before the world was made to be your holy people without fault in your sight. You adopted us as your children in Christ. You have set us free by his blood. You have forgiven our sins. You have made known to us your secret purpose to bring heaven and earth into unity in Christ. You have given us your Holy Spirit, the seal and pledge of our inheritance. You have loved us with unfailing self-giving mercy but we have not loved you. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we walk away from neighbours in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare and greed. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and in truth, admit our sin, and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening item of praise is a new hymn that's in our hymn books, hymn number 500. Uh, but the words, uh, uh, the words won't appear on the screen because we're actually going to listen to Calvin and Cain as they sing for us, God of grace, amazing wonder. Thank you. 
thank you to Calvin and Cain for leading us in praise. We're now coming to the section on baptism, uh, and in a moment we're going to baptise Asher McCausland. But before I ask his parents to step forward, I want to speak a little bit about what baptism is all about. Baptism is a celebration of God's grace, not of human achievement. It is a means of grace through which God acts to seal his promises in the gospel. Baptism isn't an end on itself. It points forward beyond itself to celebrate God's grace and his covenant faithfulness. At the same time, it's not unimportant. It's an opportunity for us to celebrate the gift of new life and the abundant grace of God offered to us in Jesus. So we celebrate that act of baptism, the sacrament of baptism this morning. Because baptism is a sign of the covenant relationship that we have with God. Our relationship with him is based on his promises to us. And baptism conveys these promises to us in this world. It is a personal matter, but it is not a private matter. That's why we celebrate it together in a gathered congregation. In this congregation, we represent the church as it is now in this time and in all places. So we welcome um, Asher McCausland uh, to this act of baptism this morning. And as we do so, I'd like to read some passages from scripture. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. And on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter said, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The sacrament is a sign and a seal of the covenant of grace which God has made with us. The children of Christian parents, though they may not understand these things, are within that covenant and belong to the life of the church. Since Asher is not yet of an age to speak for himself, his parents and the congregation will make promises that through Christian nurture in the grace of God, he may come to profess his own faith and serve Christ in the church and in the world. So we're going to come down now to the baptismal font and make the preparations necessary for the baptism. In these days of coronavirus, we need to sanitize our hands at all times. We also have to ensure that the water that we use for Asher's baptism is clean. So we've got some bottled water and a little jug. So we're all ready for the baptism. Could I invite the congregation to stand and Gary and Bronwyn and Asher to come forward. So we come to make your vows. In presenting Asher for baptism, do you profess your faith in God as your creator and father, in Jesus Christ as your Lord and saviour, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide? And will you, by God's help, provide a Christian home and bring Asher up in the worship and teaching of the church so that he may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour? And then to the congregation gathered here, do you who now in Christ's name receive Asher into the fellowship of the church, promise with God's help, so to order your congregational life and witness that he may grow up in the knowledge and love of God, 
and be continuously surrounded by Christian example and influence. That's great. Bronwyn and Gary will now bring um, Asher over to the baptismal font so that I can pour water on him, on his head, as a sign and a seal of the cleansing power of Jesus' blood over sin and death. Asher John McCausland, I baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and abide with you forever. Amen. Asher is now received according to Christ's command into the membership of the Holy Universal and Apostolic Church and he is engaged to be the Lord's. Um, we're now going to listen to the words of the ironic blessing um, as a sign of God's blessing towards Asher. The congregation may be seated and so may Bronwyn and Gary. we have sung the Lord's blessing over Asher uh, and thanks to our four uh, singers for doing that for us. We're now going to pray for Asher so let's join together in prayer. Almighty and eternal God we thank you that in your infinite mercy and goodness you have promised to be not only our God but also the God and father of our children and you have received Asher by baptism into the life of your church. Guard and keep him all his days. May your love hold him, your truth guide him, your joy delight him. May he grow strong in body and mind and come to faith in Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Make his home a place of safety and security and help his parents to teach him your truth and lead him in your ways. And we pray for all families in this congregation. May you be cherished in all our homes. May your presence in our midst transform our lives and may all our children grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we thank God for his blessings to us and for the blessing that Asher has brought uh, to the McCausland and Clements families. We turn now to the scriptures to read of more blessings that we have received from God in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. 
It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in coming days we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, <coughs> created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen, and we thank God for his word to us this morning. So over the last number of weeks, we have been focusing on things that we can give thanks for, and we've been putting things into our little thank you jar. And there are some people in the congregation I know who have started their own thank you jar, um, as I was encouraging people to um, think about all the things that we can give thanks for in this season, to pop them into the jar and to remember to say a prayer as we do so for that. And so this week, our focus is on giving thanks for God's grace to us. Giving thanks for God's grace to us. So that goes into the jar. Grace is a character of God. God is known as gracious. We can think of the Psalms, which tell us that he's abounding in love and graciousness. But what exactly does grace mean? Grace is a girl's name. Um, grace might be something that we would say before meals. But what exactly does it mean? It's like an old fashioned type of word. It's not a word that we would use very often today. But grace means favor, showing favor towards another person. And in showing that favor to the other person, it's favor that hasn't been earned, called unmerited favor. It's not because the person who receives the favour or the grace has done anything to deserve it. It's that the person wishes to show them favour and grace. So if you take a person who works eight hours a day and gets paid for the eight hours that they've worked, that's called a wage because they've worked for the, the money and they've received the wage. You can take a person who competes in a competition they win the competition and they receive a prize. They get prize because they've competed in the competition. They get the wage because they've done the work to deserve the wage. Or a person after 40 years service in their job receives a gold watch as an achievement of long service. The award is given to them because of their long service. The prize is given because you've competed in the competition. The wage is given because you've worked eight hours a day. But grace is receiving the wage when you haven't worked for it. Grace is receiving the prize when you haven't run for it. Grace is receiving the award when you haven't served for it. So the grace is given unmerited. We haven't done anything to receive it. And that's God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. Jesus is a wage that we could not earn. He's a prize that we could not win. He's an award that we could not achieve. We only receive it because of God's unmerited favor towards us. That's grace something that we receive that we have not earned. It is a gift of God, a gift of generosity. It's not if you do this, then you will get this, as most parents will do for their children. If you behave yourself, you'll get some sweeties. I'm sure Asher will probably have a few of those um, instructions in his day, but it's more like on his birthday. He's gonna get presents on his birthday because his parents love him. And whether he's been good or bad throughout the year, he's going to be lavished with love on his birthday because it's given from the generosity of his parents and from their good heart. And in the scriptures, there are many uh, examples of when we get unmerited grace. And it's easy to understand why we give Asher presents on his birthday. 
But what about giving someone grace when they don't deserve it? You know the story of Jacob and Esau? Jacob stole Esau's birthright and ran away. The story is told of when Jacob returns to Esau and he asks for Esau's favour. He said, I have done wrong in your sight. I've stolen your birthright. Will you show me favour? And it was in Esau's hands. He could have sought retribution. He could have sought justice. What he gave was grace. He welcomed his brother back into the family home. Jacob didn't deserve it, but Esau in grace received his brother back. I think of that uh, wonderful uh, musical as I know it. Obviously it was a book before it became a musical like most things, Les Mis. Jean Valjean stole a loaf of bread in a time of extreme poverty, not for himself, but to feed his starving niece. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and after 19 years, he was put on parole with strict instructions. Valjean was traveling and he came upon the bishop um, who offered him a place to stay. So Jean Valjean stayed with the bishop, but when he was in the house, he noticed all this silver that was around and he thought to himself, if I had all of that silver, I could make a new life for himself. So he stole away in the hours of the morning with the bishop's silver in his sack, but he was caught by the police and he was brought back to the bishop. What was the bishop to do? Jean Valjean had stolen the silver, a worse crime than stealing the loaf of bread. The bishop looked at the policeman and said, but I gave Jean Valjean that silver. It's his gift to use it as he wishes. So the police had no, nothing to do. They had to leave Jean Valjean and the bishop together. And Jean Valjean stood before the bishop and the bishop said to him that he was to use this gift of silver to become an honest man. The bishop didn't keep the silver. The bishop gave the silver to Jean Valjean and told him to use it to become an honest man. It was a gift of grace on behalf of the bishop. Jean Valjean wasn't sentenced or judged because of his crime of theft. More than that, he was let free. And more than that, he was given the silver to start a new life, all on the gift of grace of the bishop. That bishop's act of grace transformed a man's life. He received the gift and his life was transformed. If you haven't seen the musical, if you haven't watched the movie, if you haven't read the book, maybe that's something you could do in the week ahead and see how his life was transformed by this act of grace. But it was a gift from the bishop to Jean Valjean, just as the gift of grace that we receive from God is God's gift to us. We haven't earned it. We haven't warranted it. It comes to us from God's generous heart. What is this perfection in this gift of grace? It is the gift in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greatest gift of God's grace that he has ever given to us. Yes, he's given us life. Yes, he's given us family. Yes, he's given us many, many blessings. But in Christ, he extends to us the greatest gift of all. Without the grace of God in Jesus Christ, we have no hope. It is at the cross of Christ that grace and mercy meet. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. We haven't earned it. God gives it to us. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Being let off the hook, not paying the price, receiving forgiveness. So grace is getting what we don't deserve and mercy is not getting what we do deserve. But that mercy comes at a price, the price of grace. We all know that if someone does something wrong, if they commit a sin, if they do something wrong, then they deserve a punishment. Just as when Asher grows up and he does something wrong, he might get punished by being put on the step or whatever the current parental practice is for uh, punishing children or letting the children understand why they've done wrong. If people aren't punished for their wrongdoing, 
then what type of a world would we live in? Everybody would do what they liked. We need punishment, don't we? But in the cross of Christ, in God's grace, the punishment for our sin is paid by Jesus. God's graciousness to us is that he doesn't inflict the punishment on us, but Christ takes it upon himself on the cross at Calvary. He pays the price for our sinfulness. In grace, he offers to us forgiveness. He does all the work. We don't do anything. Christ forgives us on the cross because he has paid the price for our sinfulness. So we don't receive what we deserve, but instead we are receive the gift of God's grace and salvation. In our passage today, we learned that it is by grace we have been saved. It is God's gift of salvation to us. We can't earn it. We can't win it. We can't achieve it through our own actions. It is his gift of unmerited favour towards us. Earned on the cross at Calvary, paid for by the blood of Jesus, and we get to receive his reward because he offers it to us free of charge. We receive it by faith and allow it to transform our lives, to live for God in the future. But salvation itself is not because we decide to do something. Salvation for Asher is not because Bronwyn and Gary have made promises. It is because God in Christ has paid the price for his sin and for our sin and offers us salvation through faith in him. So let us remember that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Unmerited favour, freely offered to us. God's riches at Christ's expense. I finish with the words of a modern hymn. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh Jesus, I sing for all that you have done for me. May you know and experience for yourselves the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ for you and for your loved ones. Amen. We come now to our prayers for others and we're going to use PCI's weekly Let's Pray material. And as we approach God in prayer, we listen to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So let us pray. Almighty God, a God of grace, we thank you for the gift of your church and we pray your blessing upon our moderator, Dr. David Bruce, as he continues to lead the church uh, through interaction with the wider community, through podcasts and sermons. And we give thanks that he is in the pulpit this morning of Bally Henry Church and will, God willing, uh, be in the Church of Anak Bone as they open next Sunday morning. We give thanks, O Lord, for his leadership, for his wisdom, and for his grace. And we pray that you would encourage and enrich him on this journey in these uncertain times. We pray too for those who serve you in other parts of this world, particularly in Southern Sudan, in Myanmar, and Indonesia. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help our global mission partners to help those who are dealing with food insecurity, with health problems, and with poor infrastructures. We thank you, Lord, for our universities and our chaplains, and we pray for chaplains as they seek to pastor and support our young people as they step out in the beginnings of their adult life. We pray that they would be able to speak into their situations and to encourage them to work and to walk in the ways of your love. And we pray, O oh Lord, for all who need an act of your grace this morning. 
people who are worried or anxious about employment, about health or family, people who are battling sickness of body and mind, people who feel lost, lonely or rejected. May each one experience your healing power, your abundant grace, your deep peace and your sustaining power. These prayers we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. And we bring this service of worship to a close. It's a service of worship based on grace. So I'm sure you can guess what hymn we're going to bring our service to a close with. And that's that wonderful hymn of Isaac Newton's Amazing Grace. I encourage you to stand and if you feel comfortable, sing uh, and praise the Lord through this wonderful hymn. It's hymn 486, Amazing Grace. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, may grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and his Saviour Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Could I ask the congregation to please be seated? Just a few instructions, sorry, on how we are to leave church. 
Um, I don't know if Bronwyn and Gary want to have a few photographs um, in church, in which case, if you're part of the baptismal party, can you just stay in your seats? Um, and then can the rest uh, of the congregation leave? People on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side by the windows, if you would stand and come forward and leave via the two doors. Uh, and then people in the middle, please remain seated until I ask you to stand and then you also can leave. Thank you. No. 